This is a statue of Beatrice Workman, which stands in Ottawa, Illinois. Beatrice died aged 54 on the 25th of August 1959 as a result of complications from radium poisoning. She was one among hundreds of other women who died, and sadly, Beatrice could have counted herself lucky. Many of the others died much younger than she did. The statue is a memorial to the women employed by the Radium Dial Company in Ottawa, who were subjected to years of exposure to harmful, radium-laced, glow-in-the-dark paint. This is the tragic tale of the so-called radium or ghost girls, whose legacy now shines just as bright as they did. Uranium was discovered in 1789, but it wasn't until more than a century later in 1896 that French scientist Henri Becquerel discovered the element's radioactive nature. His groundbreaking work was taken up by scientific power couple Pierre and Marie Curie, who in 1898 discovered polonium, which they named after Marie Curie's home nation Poland, and radium, named after the radiation emitted by the element. It was scientist and inventor Sabin van Sosoki who later discovered that when mixed with zinc sulfide, radium also happened to emit a greenish glow. The marketers of the day touted and peddled radium-coated or infused products as a miracle wonder drug. It was said to help alleviate everything from hay fever to gout to impotence. Cosmetics, chocolate bars, toothpaste and toys, not even water was safe from being combined with radium. Radithor was a radium-laced tonic which later proved to be fatal to some of those who drank it. The incredible demand for radium products also surged in no small part due to the onset of World War I in 1914. The glow-in-the-dark radium paint helped to solve a problem for the US military, allowing its soldiers and pilots to see their watches, dials and instruments in the dark without the need for bulky and expensive lamps and lights. The two American companies that take center stage in this saga are the United States Radium Corporation, based in Orange, New Jersey, and the Radium Dial Company, which was based in Ottawa, Illinois, at the heart of its production in the 1920s. The US Radium Corporation marketed its radioluminescent paint as undark, and employed young women and some girls as young as 11 and 13 to perform the delicate task of painting the small watch and clock faces. For the woman, the job was a dream come true. Styled as working in a studio as opposed to a factory, the job was perceived as less dangerous than working, say, in a wartime munitions factory, and it paid better to boot. The radium painters were paid not by the hour, but per dial painted. This meant that for most, if not all of the women, they could earn far more painting watches than working anywhere else. The radium girls were the envy of all the other women in town. They could afford to buy themselves fancier clothes and were able to secure financial independence that other women could only dream of. The women also felt that they had the privilege of working daily with one of the most sought-after substances, and one that made the women glow when they went out at night. This afforded the women a coveted status, and for which they were known in town as the Ghost Girls. The work was relatively simple, yet rewarding. The painters would be given a tray of watch dials, a vial of radium paint and a camel hair paintbrush. Delicate brushwork was required to ensure that the hands and numbers on the clock face were accurately coated in the paint. A problem that the dial painters faced was that the brushes they used would lose their shape. A technique called lip pointing was adopted to ensure that the bristles of the paintbrush stayed in a sharp point. This technique involved tipping the brush between the lips and into the mouth. Lip paint became the custom for all the radium painters, and the girls were told that the radium paint, although expensive and not to be unnecessarily wasted, was completely harmless. In fact, if anything, they were told that the paint would have a positive effect on the girls' health. No personal protective wear was provided to the painters because apparently it was thought none was needed. This was in sharp contrast to the chemists and other scientists working at these companies who wore lead aprons and handled radium only with forceps. While the true extent of radium poisoning was not yet fully understood, scientists, including its discoverers, knew full well that it was dangerous and to be handled with care. Hundreds of thousands of radium painted products, mostly watches and clocks, were shipped across America and the world. After the end of World War I, glow-in-the-dark radium clocks and watches continued to be a popular product, and so production continued just about unabated.
Radium is particularly harmful because the element gets absorbed into the bones like calcium. But unlike calcium which serves to strengthen the bones, radium does the opposite. It eats away slowly at the bones until they literally fall from a person's flesh, absolutely honeycombed. Someone with radium poisoning would first start to lose their teeth. Pulling those teeth wouldn't help because the wound would never heal. The disease would often then progress to necrosis of the jaw. The infection, for lack of a better word, would then spread to the bones and the limbs and spine and ultimately result in death. This is precisely what happened to the radium girls, the first of whom, at least as is documented, was Amelia Molly Magia. She worked for the US Radium Corporation in Orange, New Jersey. Her condition was so severe that her lower jaw pretty much fell out while she was in the dentist's chair. Molly died in 1922 when the radium bored so deep into her mouth and throat that it burst her jugular vein and she died from the resulting hemorrhage. Many other radium girls became sick and died after Maggie, but the US Radium Corporation continued to deny that their sickness and deaths were in any way related to the work at the Dial Painting Factory. The dentists who first saw to the radium girls when they started developing symptoms were at a loss as to what was going on. They didn't understand why the woman's wounds would not heal, and pulling the decaying teeth seemed only to make things worse. Their best guess was that the women were suffering from phosphorus poisoning. Fossy jaw is necrosis of the jaw, and was by that stage a well-known condition brought on by white phosphorus poisoning. The issue was of course that no phosphorus was used in the studios or factories where the women worked, so this was a dead end. Poor Molly was certified as having died of syphilis, which was apparently the only logical conclusion because she was a young single woman living on her own. This of course carried with it negative connotations and this incorrect recordal of the cause of death became a recurring theme for the dying radium girls. Despite the US Radium Corporation's continued denials, the sickness and deaths of their former employees was inevitably bad for business. In 1924, they sought to prove to the world once and for all that their radium paint was safe and had nothing to do with the deaths. Up and until this point, all the research that had been conducted on radium and its effects on the human body had been commissioned by the very companies who produced and used it in the manufacture of their products. The US Radium Corporation therefore commissioned industrial hygiene expert Cecil Drinker and his wife Catherine Drinker to investigate. The pair, along with a third investigator, William Castle, visited the New Jersey factory to observe the dial painters in action. They were appalled by what they witnessed, the dial painters having no protective equipment, freely exposing themselves to radium and even ingesting it by pointing their paintbrushes in their mouths. The drinkers were convinced that the women were being poisoned by their exposure to radium, and that the so-called gossip the US Radium Corporation feared was in fact true. This was bad news for the US Radium Corporation, and they for obvious reasons were not happy with the conclusions drawn in the drinker's report. Arthur Ruder, then president of the US Radium Corporation, convinced Cecil Drinker to not publish his report on the basis of confidentiality, which Drinker apparently reluctantly agreed to. What Cecil Drinker was not aware of, however, was that Ruder altered the drinker's report to conclude that there was no evidence of the workers suffering any ill health effects from radium, Ruder submitted the doctored report to the New Jersey Department of Labor which contained the falsified conclusion that every girl was in perfect condition. It is said that Drinker himself was furious when he learned of what had happened, and fortunately a colleague of his by the name of Alice Hamilton discovered what Ruder had done and submitted the original report to the New Jersey Department of Labor. Following the revelation of the true research report, New Jersey's Labor Commissioner ruled that all of Drinker's safety recommendations be implemented. Grace Fryer was another of the dial painters who suffered terribly from radium poisoning. She was just 18 when she started working as a radium dial painter. She too suffered initially from terrible abscesses in her mouth, with the degradation in her body being such that she started to quite literally fall apart, her vertebra crumbling and requiring metal bracing. By 1925 there was sufficient independent scientific and forensic research to confirm the ill health effects of radium poisoning. Grace was intent on seeing justice for her and her colleagues. It took however two years before she was able to find an attorney willing to take on the case. Eventually, and in 1927, Grace and four other former dial painters in New Jersey sued the US Radium Corporation. By that time, it had been many years since the dial painters had left the employ of the company and a two-year statute of limitations was raised in defense of the claims. Testimonies of the women were however heard in January and April of 1928 
with the US Radium Corporation being granted an adjournment for trial for some five months later. This adjournment was fiercely opposed by the plaintiff's attorney and prompted a severe backlash of media criticism, for some of the ladies fighting for meager compensation would likely not survive until the trial. On the 4th of June 1928, the five women accepted an out-of-court settlement. Meanwhile, the dial painters of the Radium Dial Company in Ottawa, Illinois, would have heard of the case being tried in New Jersey, however, were assured by their employer that that case was all to do with the element mesothorium. This, they alleged, was what caused the illness in the painters and was an ingredient not present in the paint that the Radium Dial Company used. In 1935, however, a suit was brought against the Radium Dial Company at the Illinois Industrial Commission by former dial painter Catherine Donahue and some others. They too had to fight against a statute of limitations defense, but were ultimately successful. This time there was no settlement and the women had their day in court. Judgment was handed down in Catherine and her colleagues' favor, however, the Radium Dial Company appealed the decision. Catherine unfortunately died before the final appeal was dismissed. The dial painters were awarded compensation, but certainly not enough to right the wrongs they had suffered. This led ultimately to a host of worker safety reforms and paved the way for the occupational health and safety regulations that exist not only in the US, but across the world as well. This is the silver lining to the story, if it can be called that, yet we can't forget that many of the women died undiagnosed and without compensation. With the dial painters generally starting their careers in their teens, Many died in their 20s and early 30s from cancer and other complications. Others, like Beatrice Workman, struggled on until later in life, ravaged all the while by cancer and the other effects of radiation poisoning. <laughs>